this uh, liquid sunshine we're getting today. And, and it reminds me that we're, we're uh, praying for and needing to work together to raise enough money to fix two roofs on our property. Every time it rains, it makes me think, oh yeah, we have roofs. <laughs> this one's been replaced, and the one on the office has been replaced. And, we're, and the preschool's been replaced, so we got three out of six roofs that are good. We have two roofs that we need to work on. That's the C building and the B building. And we're, we're needing to raise it. The information is in the bulletin. You just read it, pray over it, and do what the Lord tells you to do, okay? And then uh, yesterday morning at 10 a.m., we had a, an ordination council of men. These were pastors and deacons who met together. There were 14 men that met together to uh, question Tom Catanzaro in view of the, his call to the ministry of the gospel. And uh, the result of that meeting, which went on for about an hour and 45 minutes, I think, uh, something like that it was a very, very in-depth questioning of Tom, and the, the uh, council made a determination to recommend Tom to the church for ordination, which means, <laughs> amen. Yeah. <laughs> we want to give all of the church members an opportunity to hear his testimony, his call to the ministry and to answer questions that you might have uh, regarding his positions on Baptist doctrine and so forth. So uh, the night service today, the 6 p.m. service is going to change because we received the positive <laughs> affirmation yesterday. Tonight I think it's appropriate to give you an opportunity to be here and hear his testimony and all and ask him questions. So he's really looking forward to this. <laughs> A little nervous, but I said, "Don't worry. If you if you made it past that group yesterday, I think you'll be in really good shape. So don't worry about it." And then the other thing is, we're having a Sunday school meeting uh, immediately following. So if you're a Sunday school leader, uh, the information's in the bulletin for that too. And then the last thing, really fun thing, is next Saturday we're having a, a church work day. And this is men and women can come. What? Fun. It is really fun. Yeah, you understand. I grew up. My grandfather ran a hardware store, a country hardware store. I love anything to do with tools and parts Amen. and fixing stuff. Right? I mean, that's I just love it. So um, I think it's fun to work on stuff. It's a, it's something that you can you see accomplishment when you're done. People are not always so uh, absolute. So it's a fun thing to do. It's next Saturday morning. You'll be here and you'll be glad to be here. And then, uh, what else? Uh, Martin? Pastor. Yes. Martin also is uh, celebrating his night. Oh, that's it. I knew there was something else. Marvin Olson has turned 90 years old. He's sitting back here in the center of the He finally uh, retired as a deacon and a teacher, but I am so glad God's kept you here, brother. He's a wonderful person, so we're very thankful. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have a lot to give the Lord thanks for. Father, thank you for the rain that you're sending to our valley. We desperately need more water in Southern California. We also want to thank you, Father, for each person that's here today. We pray that everything we do or say might honor you and might really uh, prepare us to serve you and to do the work that you call us to do during this next week. And we just we just love you, Father. What a, what a blessing it is to know that you love us and gave your son Jesus for us. Now we have the privilege to represent you as ambassadors to people who need to know Christ here in this world. And so I just pray this coming week we'd be Filled with your Holy Spirit, we'd be bold and loving and care enough to tell the good news to people that we meet everywhere we meet them. And we thank you for that opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Take just a moment, look around, see somebody that you don't know, and introduce yourself to them, and then we'll worship.
third round, and my faith has found a resting place. Let's stand together, please.
who made the great lights, the sun, to govern the day, the moon and the stars to govern the night. It is love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, and who gives food to every creature. Give thanks to God in heaven. His love endures forever. Amen. I serve a risen Savior. This is not going to be on here. If you will find a hymnal and turn to 533 this morning. 533 more to help my memory.
know somebody who is in need. If I know somebody that's in need, one way or another, wow. That's a lot. I was going to ask how many of you are in need today, but I thought, I don't want to, do, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to say a lot of people today who are struggling in life because life's not easy. And, uh, I mean, I can't even remember to bring my things up to the podium. So, but I was just, just thinking, so many people are in trouble today. We need to pray. And so, uh, if you found uh, the scripture today, it's Matthew 15, beginning at verse 29. When you found it, we're going to stand and invite you to stand with me for reading. And I want us to pray for people that are hurting today. You know, uh, any, any time we meet together, I'm always aware as a pastor there are people who are struggling in life. It could be uh, a health issue, it could be a financial issue, it could be relationships, it could be just looking for a job, it could be all kinds of things. Some people are just anxious about life even though they're not going through a problem at the moment. So uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to stop and to have a word of prayer. Father, we just come before you. I want to thank you, Father, for your presence here. You remind me that we're never alone. And no matter what we ever go through in this life, we don't have to go through it just by ourselves. And beyond that, you have given us a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, not only here, in this local church, but around the world, there are brothers and sisters who with whom we have a bond, an everlasting bond of fellowship. And I want to thank you for our church family, all the brothers and sisters around the world. And, I'm, and I, it, I'm, I, it just comes to my mind, Lord, there are many of our brothers and sisters that are really struggling today. They're in more trouble than we can imagine because they're under <coughs> such great persecution. Threats. And sometimes murder of our brothers and sisters and so i want to give you thanks for the peace that we enjoy but i want to pray for brothers and sisters around the world that we and they no matter what we ever face in our life will remain faithful to you and we'll always know and remember that we're in your hand and we can trust you and there isn't any problem that we have now or they have now or will ever have that's too big for you. You're bigger. And it's a wonderful thing to know that we can pray for our loved ones who might be going through some really difficult times today and know that you already know about it and you're able to comfort them, to strengthen them, to provide for them, to give them courage, to give them the words to speak at the very moment they might need to say a witness for you. And... Uh, I just want to thank you, Lord, that we can come before you now and say, Lord, speak to us through your word, and we want to hear your voice today, your message, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Matthew 15, beginning at verse 29, and uh, Jesus left from the place he was where we were talking last week, and he was in the area near Tyre and Sidon, which is northwest about 50 miles from the Sea of Galilee and uh, he left there and it says verse 29 Jesus departed from there skirted the Sea of Galilee he went around it and it says and he went up on the mountain and sat down there then great multitudes came to him having with them the lame blind mute maimed and many others and they laid them down at Jesus' feet and Jesus healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking and the blind seeing and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and he said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. 
Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were four thousand men, besides the women and children, and he sent away the multitudes, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. Maybe seated. People will come to Jesus Christ when they know about him. People don't know who Jesus Christ is, they never hear the name of Jesus, we never speak about Jesus. People don't have any idea who Jesus is unless someone tells them. When Jesus said, before he departed and went back to heaven, he said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. The reason he said that is he, he wanted us, he commanded us to tell people about him. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You can do it by your personal life, your character, the transformation he's made in your life. Another way you can do that is by sharing scripture with people. Another way you can do that is acting like Jesus would act if he were truly living in you and using you as his vessel. And so these people come to him. Remember the previous week, last week we talked about him. He went to Tyre and Sidon and he was in a house. I think he was trying to get away. He was tired. He was trying to rest. He goes in a the house. There's no banners on the house. They didn't have the blue light special going on the roof on that house. These people were in such great need and they had heard about Jesus and they found him wherever he went. Multitudes, thousands. The story the last time was 5,000 in Matthew 14. 5,000 men plus the women and children that came. Huge number of people came to him. He just couldn't get away. He was in the house, it was just a woman that came, just a woman that came to him. And she had a daughter who was demon possessed and Jesus delivered the daughter from demon possession, even though she wasn't Jewish. She was a Gentile. And now we see in this story, 4,000 people show up. He can't even go up on a mountain and sit out and rest for a few minutes and here they come. But they would not have come unless someone had told them that Jesus was there. And these would not have come unless someone brought them. I mean, pick them up and carry them. Why? Because they were lame. They were blind. They were maimed. These were people who knew what it was to have a hard time in life. And so they had come there because people not only told them about Jesus, but the ones that could not walk, the people picked them up and carried them, not on level ground, they carried them up the mountain to Jesus. We've been talking about building bridges for people. And I submit to you these people became living bridges. Because a bridge just takes somebody from where they are and gets them to where the Lord wants them to be, from where you are on one side of the river to the other side. Without the bridge, you can't get there. These people would never have made it if people hadn't told them and even brought them. And you notice it says they laid them down at Jesus' feet. I'm not making this up. This is the, this is the story. They actually carried them and laid them down at His feet. Jesus saw them and in his great compassion, he healed them. Sometimes we have a problem distinguishing between the sovereignty and the holiness and the justice of God because he is almighty God, he alone. And understanding that that does not diminish his character. 
Some, in some theological discussions, people raise the sovereignty and the justice of God above his character. What do I mean by that? What I mean is the character of Jesus Christ never changes. And while he is holy, holy, holy God alone, and while he has all knowledge, all wisdom, all power, on the other hand, it never changes who he is, his character of love and compassion. And that's why I think some people have a struggle between how is it that God can love people? Well, that's because he loves people and has compassion. That's his character. His character is not diminished by who he is as Almighty God. He is Almighty God and sovereign, and at the same instant, he is perfect, unconditional love. And I think whenever we raise love above his power or injustice, or we raise justice above who is, we don't understand God is the same all the time. He doesn't diminish or lose any of his character attributes because he has another one. They're all there all the time. And so Jesus was not only found when he entered the house, he was found when he went up on the mountain and he was brought there. And the truth is, and I think it's a key to understand this, the people were doing the work of rich builders. They were making it possible for people to come to Christ. They would never, hear me, they would never have made it to the feet of Jesus if someone hadn't told the lame, the blind, the maimed, the mute, if someone hadn't told them and even carried them to Jesus, they never would have made it. That's why I'm telling you, it is so important for us to tell people and even to help people get from where they are to where God wants them to be in a personal relationship with Him. You're talking about mute, you know the story, you know, these are just artist depictions, but in one case, Jesus Christ took a man who couldn't speak and he didn't speak. Today we have instances, we have people who are maimed today. It breaks my heart beyond words that I could express for the men and women in uniform today who are being maimed in an attempt which I think strategically is not going to ever work, ever. To try to make a relationship, a friendly relationship, to try to appease and to build up a nation which doesn't want to be built up. A nation, because we try to separate spiritual things from political and social things, the truth is you can't do that. The spiritual always prevails. And right now we're in a spiritual warfare around the world. I understand Eric, uh, Eric Holder, our, our uh, Attorney General for the United States, was on a program this morning and he finally said, we're at war. He said, we're at war. All this time they've been talking about workplace violence and all that, but it's, we are at war with terrorists. We have many, hundreds of thousands of young people who've been injured and even maimed in this current conflict. This is an Afghan young lady. When we leave Afghanistan, this is going to get more rampant. What happened is her in-laws were abusing her. She tried to run and get away, so the Taliban issued a command or an order that her nose and her ears be cut off because she was trying to run from people who were beating her. This is who we're dealing with in the world today. So when we talk about, it's nice to just, you know, read the story and say, well, they were lame, and they were blind, and they were maimed, and they were, couldn't speak. But when you actually sit there with someone who's sitting there or standing there right in front of you who can't walk anymore, or doesn't have arms or legs anymore, or a nose or ears, who can't hear what you're saying and can't say anything for themselves, I want to tell you, there's something wrong if it doesn't touch your heart and bring out some compassion in you for people. And that's what's going on in the world today. Around the world. I 
I like this guy. It's like, he couldn't walk, and now he can walk. And his response to this is joy. And I'm not making that up. It said, the multitude marveled, verse 31, when they saw the mute speaking, and the maimed made whole, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. These people who were glorifying God were Gentiles. They were not believers. They saw, met Jesus because someone brought them to Jesus. Jesus made an impact and transformed their life, delivered them from the bondage they were in in their bodies, and they were rejoicing. And that's the privilege and the opportunity that every one of us in this room has is to represent Jesus Christ to people in the world, whoever, men, women, old, young, rich, poor, doesn't matter, skin color does not matter, every single person is precious to God. And we have a great privilege to represent Jesus Christ to people. He is the answer. And we can do this. I see a picture like this and I'm thinking, how awesome would it be to be able to lay hands on someone and restore sight to a blind person? Do you know who resides inside you? The same Holy Spirit who parted the Red Sea, who could raise the dead to life, who could do anything. And I think sometimes we forget who in the world we are and we think too little of who we are as a child of God. We forget who we are as a child of God. And we get fearful about life. But there's practical things we do. There's a lot of things about Mark Twain that I, I don't agree with, but some of the things he said were awesome. And this is a beautiful saying. He said, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. When I, when I, my translation is there's practical things that you and I can do to help people. You know, there's practical things we can do. If someone's hungry, we can get a meal for them. If somebody needs a ride, we can help them get a ride. If somebody doesn't have a place to live, we can start praying and saying, Oh God, we don't have a place to put them up, but you do. So God help us. And we can start talking to God and saying, God, help us to help people. <laughs> That's an awesome thing to do. Transform your whole life. Second thing, people who come to Jesus will be filled. I think it's very interesting that Jesus Christ calls his disciples to himself and he says to them, I have compassion on the multitude. I have compassion on the multitude. And he said, because they stayed with me for three days and they're hungry and they're tired, and I don't want to send them away hungry because they might faint on the way. What does that tell you? Just stop for a moment. What does that tell you about Jesus Christ? Some of you raised your hands and you said, you know people who are in need today. I must say to you something that is absolutely true. Jesus has compassion on you if you have needs in your life. He cares. And one of the ways that he expresses himself in his caring is through us. Or not. Through us. Or not. It's kind of up to us to join him and to cooperate with him and to be available to do the things that he would have us to do. You just pray about it. God will open your eyes. He put somebody in front of you who has a need, and then you're going to say, hmm, I guess he wants me to tell the pastor, Pastor, you need to do something about this. <laughs> what? So the pastor's wife is laughing down here. It's like, how many times do you have people come up and give me assignments? I mean, like, all, all the time. And I'm glad. I mean, I'd like to try to do everything. I wish I could do everything for everybody. I really wish I could. But I have to be honest. I can't do it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I used to say, I'm chicken man. I can fly here and fly there and to try to do everything. But you know what? With many people, we can do a lot of things together. And I don't mind pulling my part of the load either. I'm, I'm glad to. But if we all did something, man, we could do a lot of things for people. Anyway, Jesus was moved with compassion and he wanted to feed them. 
He could have sent them away without food. And I think this, I think after he had healed these who came to him, and if he had said, I don't have any food, because these people didn't know. They didn't know what he could do. I don't think the disciples got it yet either. <laughs> to be honest. Even though they had just seen him feed 5,000 people, now they're going to hurry and get enough bread. I mean, these guys are ants. That just doesn't get in who he is for a while. Anyway, he could have said, I don't have any food. You'll have to go home and find food. I hope you can find something on the way. And then most of these people wouldn't have known any better and they would have tried. But that's not Jesus. He not only fed the people, he taught his followers a lesson. He was trying to teach a lesson. Here's what he did. He asked them a question. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So when you give Jesus what little you do have, Jesus takes the little that you and I do have and he multiplies it and he will give it out and help others with it. So Jesus loves people. You can just stop for a moment and say, you know, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. He even loves me. That's a pretty amazing thing if you knew me. <laughs> And you can learn a lot about this, the character of Jesus from this story. Third thing is, Jesus can take what we have and what we give, and he can meet the needs of all who come. Here's the part that we struggle with, because in our practical mind, we're saying, but I don't have it. I don't have enough. And Jesus would say, what do you have? I don't have enough. That's not what he, he asked you. But Jesus, I don't have enough to do what you're asking me to do. And he would say, what do you have? Are you willing to trust me enough to open your hand and release it to me? I don't know, Jesus. I, I'm not so sure. I know you've done good things before, but... You know, I know I've done a lot of stuff, and I'm, I'm sure you probably wouldn't take whatever I gave you and multiply it to help somebody else, I'm sure. Jesus said, what do you have? That was his question. Look at this. His disciples said, where could we get enough bread? You know, it's almost funny, it's, like, it's pretty sad in the wilderness to fill such a multitude. And Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. So Jesus commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. Y'all sit down on the ground. I want to show you something. But you notice something else? It wasn't about Jesus. <laughs> oh, watch what I can do with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Watch what I can do. He never did that. He just said, what do you have? He broke it. He prayed. Give thanks for it. Blessed it. And multiplied it. I think sometimes he, it was so amazing what he did, but I think he was so subtle in the way that he did it, not drawing attention so much to himself even, that they just it took him a while to get it, who he is. And so they ate. And they were filled. And they took up seven large baskets, full fragments were left. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. You could ask Jesus any question. I don't know what your need is or the need of someone that you know, but you can ask Jesus a question. If you're being honest and you ask him a sincere question, not trying to be smart out it, but just ask him a sincere question. Jesus, I don't see how... how we can do this. I, Jesus, I don't see how we could ever turn America around. Jesus, I don't see how we could help people to get their life on track with you when they're so opposed to you and to the Word of God. Again and again. Jesus says, what do you have? Let me, let me have it for a moment. So when they said, where could we get enough bread? They're standing before the bread of life himself. They're standing before the one that just fed 4,000 men, or 5,000. Now this is only 4,000. It's a smaller job. These guys were really slower. 
So when he says, how many loaves do you have? Jesus was making sure that they understood how little they had. He wasn't trying to say, oh, I thought you might have more. <laughs> he was saying, how little do you have? And they, how much do you have? And they go, well, we only got a little bit. And he says, that's enough. He wanted them to acknowledge we don't have enough. They had to say, Jesus, we don't have enough. And when, he's, when they got that, he went, oh, good, you understand. You don't have enough. <laughs> Yeesh. <laughs> he knows you and I don't have enough either. That's not what he asked us. Jesus doesn't ask you and me to come up with the answer for, the power for, the resources for, resources for every problem that comes our way. He asks the question, how much do you have? Will you trust me with it? Will you entrust to me what you do have and then watch and see what I can do when I multiply it to meet the needs of people? That's what he does. <laughs> Men, have you ever had to cook when your wife was away? I hate it when my wife's away. I am lonely. And hungry. I never go hungry. Somebody said hungry. I don't get hungry because I eat. I read a story about a preacher who had to prepare for a meal for himself, so he drove up to the window of the Burger King, and he got up to the window of the Burger King, and he was asking for food, and the, the little gal behind the window said, uh, what would, you, what would you like? He said, I would like a cheeseburger meal. And she turns around and she says, What a kid's meal? And he said, uh, I didn't ask for a kid's meal. He said, It's the same. She said, It's the same thing. We just charge you more without the box. <laughs> he had a chance to prepare a meal for himself, but instead he went to the Burger King. And I think it's kind of that way in our personal life. We cheat ourselves out of what God can do in our life when we try to handle it in our own limited ability and limited understanding and we don't reach out and step out in faith and realize we serve a great God and He is far bigger and more capable than what we think He is in our own limited thinking. So we cheat ourselves. We need to supersize our faith. God can handle any problem you, you and I bring to Him. In fact, Jesus can meet the needs of people who come to Him if you have faith in Him. Just trust Him. The miracle in Matthew 15, some of you are saying, well, I think it's the same miracle, but it was recorded 4,000 in one way and 5,000 in another. I'm going to tell you, no, it's another miracle, and they still haven't gotten it. It's a whole chapter later, you know. They forgot already. The feeding of the 5,000 took place in Galilee. If you read the text, it's there. The feeding of the 4,000 was in the Decapolis, which was east of the Sea of Galilee. In the 5,000, there were five loaves and two fish. In the 4,000, there were seven loaves and a few small fish. In the 5,000, there were 12 baskets left over. In the 4,000, there were seven large baskets left over. The Greek words for baskets is not even the same. The word for baskets in Matthew 14, the feeding of the 5,000, is a small Jewish woven basket. The word for baskets in the feeding of the 4,000, where it was another Greek word which was used for a basket used by Gentiles, it's a large basket like a hamper, great big one. So it wasn't even the same kind of basket. The feeding of the 5,000, the crowd had only been with him one day. The feeding of the 4,000, they had been with him for three days. The feeding of the 5,000 was in the spring of the year. The feeding of the 4,000 was in the summer. The feeding of the 5,000, they tried to make him the king. The feeding of the 4,000, they didn't try to make him the king. There's a lot of differences. The feeding of the 5,000 was mostly to a Jewish group, and the feeding of the 4,000 was mostly a Gentile group. Jesus performed a miracle by feeding a vast multitude of people among the Gentiles and among the Jews, and this proves to us that He is the bread of life to the entire world. Amen. Whosoever comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out, and He meant everybody who will come to Him. So when you and I come against great needs, Jesus Christ wants every one of us to trust Him, put our faith in Him. 
I understand he's bigger than any need you and I'll ever face. So when we ask the question, do I have enough? It's the wrong question. Am I willing to trust God enough to surrender myself and what I do have for him to take it and to use it to accomplish his purpose? Some of you are thinking, well, if I give it away, then I won't have anything. I got some news. You need to hear this. You will not ever outgive God. You will never, ever outgive God. He will not be a debtor to anyone. God has really good credit. I don't know what the highest number on the credit is, but his is higher. He has credit and it'll never run out. So when you give your, let's say you give all that you are and all that you have to him, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you give Jesus everything that you are. He gives you himself. Who came out on that deal? I mean, you did, and you will, every time. You cannot outgive God. Read Malachi about that. He'll fill you up to where you're overflowing in your life, and you're going to go, there's no end of it. It's like God just always knows what I do and what I give. Well, yeah, duh. And He can always meet your needs. Matthew 16, 19, 16, 9. Some of you are wondering about what my information on the 4 and 5. Don't you yet, not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000? This is Jesus speaking. And how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? Jesus is explaining to them there were two different instances here. Don't you remember? And don't you remember? <laughs> he says, how is it you don't understand that I didn't speak to you concerning the bread? Bread is not a big deal for Jesus. Bread and fish. But to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they understood. He wasn't talking to them about bread. It wasn't about bread. It's about he's the bread of life. And there are others that try to feed you a line that's not true. Lines that say things like the Bible's not true. Or there is no God. Or all, God, all religions are false. Well, there are a lot of false religions. But there is one true God. And he sent his son, Jesus, for us. Then they understood that he didn't tell them to beware of the leaven of bread of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. By the way, leaven or unleavened bread won't get you to heaven or send you to hell. Lack of faith in Jesus Christ will. Somebody might say, I need a good Christian mate. And the woods are not full of them. And you don't have to worry because God is on the throne. He can make blind eyes see, and He can even make you look good to somebody else. Or make them look good to you. Our needs are great, but actually God is greater. God is not limited to provide what we need according to our ability. So a lot of times we get stuck and then we got worried because we're thinking, I just don't have enough. And He can say, well, then give your good you have to God and watch what He does. <laughs> It's about time, it's about talents, it's about obedience, giving. I'm not talking just about money, I'm talking about all that you are. God can take down a giant with a sling of a boy if you trust him. God can feed millions of people with manna. He's already done it. God can make water come out of a rock. God can make the sun stand still. God can transform a terrorist named Saul into a preacher named Paul. God can take care of the needs of a widow and an orphan, even if they only have a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal left in the jars. And He can make it enough. The truth is, Jesus Christ can meet our needs when we trust Him enough to let go of what we do have and give Him as He's prospered us, which is little or much. Everybody's different. But the question is, do we trust Jesus Christ enough to surrender the control of our life to Him? Do we trust Him enough and do we love Him enough to be willing to obey Him, whatever He asks us to do? When you get, you want to be set free? Just surrender the control of your life to Him, give Him the keys to your heart, 
and watch what he does with your life, you'll never be sorry. So when Jesus asks, how many loaves do you have? You just take whatever you do have, and you offer yourself and your resources to him, and watch and see what God does. I'm telling you, he will blow your mind with what he is capable of doing in your life if you just trust him. I want us to stop and to pray now and to ask the Lord to supersize our faith. Father, I just come before you now as your child. You know how I am. When I approach you, I just see myself like a little boy reaching up to you. God, I know in my heart I think I can reach up to you. But spiritually, I know I can't. <laughs> All it takes is me reaching my hand up to you sincerely and you reach down and take my hand. Oh Lord, if I were strong enough, I'd hold on to your hand and never let go. But you know I get distracted. You know I get tired. You know I get weak. You know I get discouraged. And you never let go. Thank you for carrying me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for meeting the needs of people. Oh God, how I wish I could meet the needs of every person who came to me. But I know I can't. But I know you can. Because you're God. You are amazing. And I thank you that I serve, and we all can serve, a living God who is holy, and yet he loves us, who is just, and yet willing to forgive us because your son Jesus took the punishment for our sin. Increase our faith in you. Cause us to never, ever forget our God is greater than any problem we or our loved ones, our friends will ever face. Thank you for never forsaking us, ever. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.